Well, if you saw this piece in the Thai E, you would have seen the picture of the Titanic. But the piece itself is about housing affordability and more specifically about the citywide plan at Vancouver City Council. And it's written by Patrick Condon, who is the James Taylor Chair in Landscape and Livable Environments at UBC's School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture and the founding chair of the UBC Urban Design Program. And he joins us on the line now to talk a bit more about this. Thank you so much for being with us. Glad to be here, Jill. Uh, the, the title of this, the headline is that a titanic lack of focus may sink Vancouver's chance to make housing affordable. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about what you mean? Well, it's intentionally provocative, but what we mean is, by, what I mean by that is that uh, the City Council has put forward a proposal for a city plan that has 12 different obje- has a dozen different objectives and they are not ranked and they don't give priority to the housing crisis that we all know is here so the the idea that's being expressed here in the article is that they should prioritize the housing crisis first and foremost which they haven't so far done and I hope they will And the citywide plan also, some of the criticism of it has been uh, as well, as well as criticism of this council, has been that they spend a lot of time dealing with issues that aren't even in their jurisdiction. Yeah, that's right. What's really in their jurisdiction is land use and transportation, particularly land use as a traditional power of the city government. They have incredible powers to limit the use of land to whatever purpose they want. So given that, the city council and the city generally could uh, could institute a, a set of policy procedures by which they could not only encourage uh, affordable housing, which they're doing now, but they could insist on it. And they have that power, and they're not recognizing that they do. And what do you think they could do? I mean, is it something, I would say as simple as, but it's never really simple, but reducing fees that add to the cost of housing? Is it streamlining the approval process for new buildings? What do you think they could do immediately? Uh, those things might be important, but the real problem in the city of Vancouver and elsewhere is the land costs are out of control. And land costs go up when the city allows for additional density. It, it goes up uh, in measure to that density. If you double the allowable density on a parcel, it doubles the cost of the land. So the real beneficiaries of any uh, attempts to increase density are not are not the people who buy the housing, but they're the, they're the people who happen to own the land. Or and in many cases, those people are professional land speculators. So what the article suggests is really quite simple. If, if the city is going to increased density. If the city decides to allow increases in density, they should also insist on social benefit, that some of the some of the increase in land value or a large amount of the increase in land value should go to make, making sure that people can afford to live here through the provision of uh, non-market housing. There could be uh, co-ops or, or uh, uh, dwelling units that are owned and operated by non-governmental organizations and so forth. And do you think that there's an appetite to do that, or why why isn't that at the top of the list? That's a kind of curiosity to me. I'm not sure why it is. I, I think we've gotten in the habit in the city of Vancouver and elsewhere of not recognizing the power of the city and this true action. Actually, the city, the city is more powerful uh, in terms of delivering affordable housing than the federal government and the provincial government who can only pour money into the problem which tends to increase the price of land so i think there's a a failure of recognizing the powers and a kind of seduction of other issues that they are really not responsible for The, the list of 12 objectives even includes something about something that obliquely refers to a high speed rail line to Seattle, for goodness sakes. I mean, that's really way outside the purview of the city. Well, and, and I have it in front of me, and you're right. I, I looked at some of these and thought, how is that on the list of top priorities? It's making connections to the metropolitan region and Cascadia. I don't even know what that means. It's a reference to some enthusiasm in City Hall for the high-speed rail line proposal at $30 billion or whatever. Uh, and it really has nothing to do with the city, but the 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 current proposal for the citywide plan is a grab bag of all kinds of good things over over which the city really doesn't have direct control. And that diminishes the focus on land use, which they do have. 
direct control over. Because one of the other ones, too, is uh, enhancing social well-being and local food security. Which yeah, again, that's right. Sounds good, but I'm not sure if you went out and asked 100 people on the street what they what's a top priority for the city council. I'm not sure that one would come up. No, I don't think so. I think everybody recognizes that housing is the one and almost only issue for the city right now. And if we don't solve that one, the city as we know it is going to disappear. So what about issues when we when we talk about housing, but then we see development proposals uh, like the one at Broadway and Birch, which has had a lot of pushback because the developer wants to build a 28 story tower and a lot of people in the community saying that doesn't fit. Uh, we had another one at uh, Main Street and Main and Kingsway that did go ahead that many people in the community said was way too big. How do we kind of make it? How do we find common ground there when we do see these bigger projects, but see so much pushback? Well, what I'm, what I'm, what the article's trying to get across is that adding density to get affordable housing is is really f- putting fuel on the fire of inflated land prices. When you add, when when you allow for a very large building like that, uh, at the end of the day, the apartments that are rented are not affordable. The only real beneficiary of that is the la- the landowner who happens to own the land that the value for which is incredibly increased by the city's action to allow that additional density. And the city's not effectively capturing that that value for social purpose, for housing that is truly affordable. It doesn't do any good to put new rental units at the very top of the income level. That just increases the, the, the likelihood that people people in middle income and lower income levels are going to be forced out of the city. Well, and and that's what we hear from the city as well. And the previous council also, it was that wage range of between thirty and eighty thousand, which is a huge range. Uh, but saying that that was the focus of trying to get housing that to people making those wages, families making that wage, would be able to live in the city. I mean, is that even doable? Not the way they're doing it, in my view. Uh, the previous uh, council oversaw the creation of new rental units that were almost entirely, in fact, they were entirely at the high level for income. There was, there was not a single unit produced for medium and low income earners through their previous efforts. So as valiant as they may have thought they were, they're, they're just simply not working. And, and my argument is that they weren't working because the real way to get affordable housing is to capture the value of land uh, density increases and use that use that as a as a lever to get permanently affordable housing in the form of nonprofit housing. And you mentioned co-ops earlier as well, and that's something that has come up time and time again. In that there used to be a federal program, and there used to be uh, more of an emphasis on building co-op housing, which for many people is an affordable type of housing. Um, has the shift away from that? Do you think led to to this lack of affordable housing? Absolutely. Up until the 1980s uh, and the early 1990s, we we were in this city making great progress in affordable housing. Now we have 15% of all housing in the city is non-market housing. But they they decided the national and provincial governments, and this is not just Canada, but throughout the world really, in the 1990s, decided that the best the best producer of housing would be the the private marketplace that worked for a while but now with income inequality being so so extreme and land values going up so so high the 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 inequality is is at the break point and it and it focuses largely on housing the the greatest gap between uh between average wages and what you need to buy in order to have a decent life is the price of housing that's where inequality really is focused So aside, though, from uh, government subsidies and subsidized housing, uh, how else do you fix that? Well, I like to think that it's not really government subsidies if, if in fact, the city is putting itself in a position of saying, well, we can either leave the land alone and not upzone, or if we do upzone, we have a right to extract from the tremendous increase in value some social benefit in the form of payments for for uh, co-op housing that we could supply or some of those units being deeded over to a non-governmental organization or a co-op. All right. Uh, What kind of response have you had to to this piece? 
uh, great, great among people who, you know, are my friends and so forth who, who understand this issue. But it's it's a hard sell because we haven't really uh, found a way to support co-op housing or non-market housing since the 1980s. So people are not used to the idea that this is something that's possible to do. All right. Well, we will have to leave it there. We're out of time. But thank you so much for joining us sure, to talk Joe. about this.